Hello, in this presentation we will discuss ethics and profession. Objectives. We will be able to, at the end of this, define profession. Define ethics as it relates to accounting. Explain the factors that increase the likelihood of fraud. Describe internal controls. Profession. The definition of a profession. A profession is a calling requiring specialized knowledge and often long and intensive academic preparation. When thinking about profession, we often think about a doctor or a lawyer being two of the primary professions that we first think of. And when we consider those professions, we note that the major component of those professions are that they're providing a service and a service which most people do not have intimate knowledge about. In other words, if we were to go to the doctor, for example, if, and had a problem, and the doctor was to give us some information, some advice, we would not have the information ourselves to be able to verify that advice very readily. It would take a lot of research in order for us to really understand the, the prescriptions that are given to us. Now in today's society with Google and all these other resources out there, it is possible for an individual more often to check in on the information, but to really understand a profession, we would really have to do a lot more research than any normal individual could do in order to really verify the advice being given to them by the professional, in this case, the doctor. Therefore, the doctor really has an uneven amount of knowledge when considering a transaction. When we consider transactions from an economic standpoint, we typically think of a free market being an ideal situation when the individuals involved in the market, in this case the doctor selling their services and the individual consuming the services, are have an equal amount of knowledge. We're assuming many times within a transaction that there's some equality in terms of the knowledge and therefore the price can be getting to uh, ideally through the market, through negotiation within the market. When we're dealing with professions, however, we have this, this unequality in terms of the knowledge and therefore there's more responsibility many times in terms of the profession uh, to, to be honest within the profession and there's more likelihood or more ability for a fra fraudulent type of transactions to take place when there's uh, unequal knowledge and therefore the profession needs some type oftentimes of regulation in order to really keep the profession in a position where the people acting within the profession can have the trust from the society in order to uh, do the work that they do because if they don't have the trust from people within the society they could be the best doctor the best lawyer out there but they won't be able to practice and do what they could do for their individuals for their clients unless the clients are willing to uh, to trust what what the doctor and lawyers have to say therefore the idea of the profession because of this uneven knowledge really comes down to the concept of trust we need these trust within the profession in a way that we don't need them in many other types of profession for example if we went to the grocery store and were to buy groceries we can quickly assess fairly readily whether or not they're selling fresh fruit or something like that and uh, we can we can the transactions are usually not large enough in that we're going to have many different transactions that we can then switch stores after first go into a store and we can shop around when considering a profession however we're typically dealing with things that might be fewer transactions and we might have more on the line when we're considering something in terms of a doctor's decision or in terms of a legal decision and therefore we don't have that the same kind of opportunity and we don't and that we would have in some other kind of transactions therefore the concept of trust is going to be a lot more important in the profession trust is going to be important in any business of course but within a profession it's going to be really important because the people that are dealing with the professional need, need to basically be able to trust the professional and the professional the profession itself then benefits from trust not just the individuals within the profession but the whole profession will benefit from a, a greater trust and we can see that from examples we've seen this in in past history movies are always playing types of examples where a lawyer or a doctor are uh, basically scamming individuals 
In that case, you can imagine a situation where someone claiming to have medical knowledge goes to a small town and sells, sells tonics that are claiming to uh, cure everything uh, that, that can be out there <laughs> with, with the tonic and whatnot, and then moving to another town uh, before anybody knows that the tonic doesn't, doesn't do anything. We, we, those type of ideas are things that have happened in the past and things that are often portrayed in movies. Now, when that happens, however, note what's really going on is that the person claiming to have medical knowledge is, in essence, claiming to be a professional in the medical field, and therefore they're making money off of the brand name of a profession. They're basically saying, I'm this kind of kind of doctor, I'm this kind of professional, and therefore you should trust what I am saying and purchase this thing from me which will cure your problems. And if that, if that does not happen, then that person may profit and may leave, but the next person that goes into town that may really actually have some understanding has a lot less likelihood and less ability to help the people with actual knowledge and actual cures uh, after that type of situation has happened. So the, the level of trust will go down if certain individuals that claim to be within a, in a profession are making money off of uh, bringing down the brand name of the profession. In essence, they're making off of money off of selling the goodwill of the brand name of the profession. Therefore, the profession itself typically has um, incentive, has a lot of incentive in order to self-regulate. So these types of, of areas, we can see it happening, of course, in the medical profession. We see it happening in the legal profession that those two professions are going to get together and start to, to format uh, uh, institutions that will help to self-regulate the profession in the hopes that more people can be helped by the profession by including or increasing the brand of the profession, increasing the trust then of the people that are involved in that profession. Now, of course, the legal profession came, up, came about a bit later on from the uh, law and the... Now, of course, the legal profession came about a bit later on from the le now of course the accounting profession came a bit later on from the legal profession and the medical profession because there became a much more need for accountants to have much more specialized knowledge as business became more complex as businesses grow as businesses get larger as uh, specialization and more regulations are involved in different areas of the business in terms of payroll areas and other regulations in terms of you know audits and all this kind of stuff that are increasing the complication within the accounting field that leads to, to more specialization that will be needed within the accounting field and this a lot of this happened when the concept of incorporating took place when the idea of having a separate legal entity in terms of a corporation uh, was put into place then, of course, a lot of things got more complicated in terms of how are we going to regulate the separate corporations and, and a lot of different information is needed from those financial standpoints. And therefore, the, the concept of the need for, within a society, the accountants to self-regulate, to have some form of regulation in order to build trust within uh, an, an area so that people can then uh, take the ser use services in terms of accounting in order to help generate value within a community and of course that happens in terms of the normal accounting profession and now of course subcategories within the accounting profession so we have people working specifically in audit we have people working specifically in payroll and many different other areas which in essence are going to be areas specific or branches off of accounting uh, the accounting profession as a whole Ethics definition, Merriam-Webster, uh, ethics plural in form but singular or plural in construction, the discipline dealing with what is good and bad and with moral duty and obligation, or ethics definition. There's going to be a ton of definitions to ethics. I'm just going to pull a few of them just to give an example of the definitions of ethics and then discuss a bit about these definitions and how they relate to ethics as they are related to uh, the profession of ethics. Ethics, plural in form, but singular or plural in construction, the discipline dealing with what is good and bad and with moral duty and obligation. Uh, a set of moral principles, a theory or system of moral values that present day materialistic ethic on old fashioned work ethic, 
uh, often used in plural but singular or plural in construction on elaborate ethics, Christian ethics, ethics plural in form but singular in plural in construction, the principles of conduct governing an individual or a group of professional ethics, a guiding philosophy, a uh, consensus of moral importance, uh, forge a uh, conservative ethic. So notice that ethics is going to have a lot of different um, things or a lot of different definitions that can be applied to ethics. Ethics, of course, is something that has been studied for a very long time and it's still going to be studied uh, for basically ever in terms of what is ethics and what types of, of ethics, what things are ethical or not. And uh, in terms of the profession, then, what we need to do is narrow down this discussion. We need to narrow down the discussion of, of total ethics and at least apply it to or specify it in the form of ethics as it relates to profession and more specifically as it relates to the accounting profession. When considering ethics as it relates to the accounting profession, we can think of narrowing it down in some kind of a, of a utilitarian type of concept in that when we're dealing with ethics of a profession, we typically want people to act within the profession in a way that would be beneficial for the profession as a whole. So if we take our example that we were looking at in terms of somebody selling a medical, uh, some type of medicine that doesn't work in order to basically scam individuals claiming to be a professional within the medic profession, that then may benefit that individual in terms of profits. However, it would be harmful to, of course, the profession as a whole. The profession as a whole would have problems. And therefore, one way to consider this and one, one idea of ethics in general is this utilitarian uh, kind of concept. What would be good for the, for the group as a whole? What would be good if all people within the group, in this case, that group being the professionals, uh, which would lead to something that would be good for basically everybody within the group, meaning things that would be beneficial to the brand name of uh, the people within the group. Those would typically be one kind of way that we may consider how ethics might be considered within the profession, within a profession, or basically any type of profession. Uh, another idea that will be within the profession is how are we going to basically regulate? How should professions be regulated? Uh, we know that the accounting profession, we generally have these uh, generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP. We know that uh, there's going to be federal regulations in many different areas in terms of the Securities and Exchange Commission often has uh, regulations over the financial activities. Note that, however, the Securities and Exchange uh, often delegates a lot of that authority from the federal standpoint in terms of the Securities and Exchange to private to the private sector in terms of the people within the profession, meaning people within the profession have that incentive to self-regulate and it's often beneficial to allow that to happen. So although we have the Securities and Exchange Commission here, which is going to be a federal regulation, we also have the, um, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, the FASB, which is often represented or, or responsible for issuing uh, the, the actual regulatory uh, FASB regulations. And the FASB then is actually uh, a, not a government agency, but a private organization. And that's this idea that the private organization has that incentive to self-regulate. And it's usually a good idea to incentivize or put in place that structure for the self-regulation because the people within the profession having that, that incentive to self-regulate generally are better at putting together the policies in order to uh, set up that, that self-regulation within uh, a profession. Fraud is going to be another component of ethics within an accounting profession, something that we're always going to be concerned about within uh, the accounting profession. Fraud has to do with intention. So when we're thinking about something that happened, we're usually saying, well, something something happened. Was it fraudulent? That usually means that something happened with intent for it to happen. And so this happens all, all through the legal code. And it seems obvious, but uh, when you consider the outcomes, it may not seem as obvious as it looks in first glance. Meaning, for example, if somebody uh, hit somebody, somebody got hit by a car, uh, then if someone died from being hit by a car, then we would ask the question if the driver of the car accidentally ran into somebody or did they uh, do it on purpose. 
And the interesting thing here is, of course, the outcome is the same. Someone has died from being hit by a car, and someone, of course, was driving the car, and therefore you would think that the consequences would then be the same. But they're typically not. We're typically going to say if it was an intentional thing, then that's premeditated kind of murder, possibly. And if it was unintentional, maybe it would be like manslaughter. Two things that have vastly different outcomes in terms of what uh, the code is going to say. So intention uh, is, is different from outcome in terms of uh, the, the legal code. And so fraud will have that intention. Of course, from a financial standpoint, in terms of, of accounting, we're talking about things typically that would have would be theft within within an organization or fraudulently reporting the financial statements in order to uh, make them look better for the, the, the stockholders for the for the stockholders or in order to get bonuses or whatnot uh, in terms of management. Those would be the type of things that could take place in terms of fraud internally. And again, the question is, well, did this happen? I mean, was there an error in the financial statements intentionally? Or was there, was it just an error? Was it an intentional misrepresentation of the financial statements or intentional? Uh, or was it just an error? Not always an easy thing to, to prove intention, of course, but uh, something that, that is going to be the component of fraud. Now, when we're considering the, the organization, there are what we call the fraud factors. And these are going to be components, there are what we call fraud factors, and these are going to be those components that are going to contribute to fraud. When we ask somebody, um, if we were to ask how, how can a company prevent fraud from happening when in, within the organization, first they might say, hey, fraud typically happens from employees is, is, is the most common fraudulent uh, cases and theft and whatnot that will take place is actually the employees. And therefore, we would want to hire, make sure we hire ethical employees, employees that won't commit fraud. And while that is one component that is very important to uh, reducing fraud, it's really not the only component to reducing the fraud because uh, even ethical people that are in a, an environment that is not ethical uh, will still have problem. The likelihood of fraud happening is, is still going to be high for one. And for two, it's, it's difficult to know exactly uh, the you know in an interview process exactly what type of individuals we are we are putting in place and therefore although we want to have a good interview process we also want to have the environment in such a way that it reduces what we would call the fraud factors and fraud factors include uh, opportunity uh, pressure and rationalization so these are the kind of the components that have been studied as in terms of what is there when fraud happens what are the components that are usually present in terms of those cases where fraud has taken place one is going to be of course opportunity meaning if somebody thinks that they can commit fraud such as financial fraud such as theft then and they don't think they're going to be caught for that theft then the likelihood of it happening would go up the second would be pressure and that would seem obvious if there's financial pressure in particular when we're talking about financial fraud, then uh, if there's if there's a financial problem, then the likelihood of fraud goes up. And the third is an interesting one, and that's going to be rationalization. And rationalization is important because uh, we typically think that we actually think about what we're going to do, and then we do it. And that's usually that might be the case when we make big decisions, but most of the decisions we make, we actually tend to make the decision kind of intuitively. And then our brains are really good at rationalizing what we actually did, what the, what the actions that were taken. And therefore that rationalization process uh, will actually lead to oftentimes uh, a fraud that will uh, at least continue once it starts or, and or increase after, after it has started. And therefore, um, when considering that, we want to make sure that the fraud then is, is stopped early uh, and, or, and or caught before, before it happens because otherwise that rationalization process may lead to uh, more fraudulent behavior and more fraudulent behavior that goes on to an extended period of time. So then the question then, of course, for the company is, how can we reduce these types of things? How can we reduce the opportunity, the pressure, and the rationalization? And part of that would be the internal controls that we would want to put in place. So clearly things like uh, if, if there was an opportunity out there, if we just had our money that we just happened to store all of our all of our money in the middle of the lunchroom and we have no cameras in there or anything and everybody eats in there, then that would that wouldn't be uh, that would 
would uh, lead people to possibly think that they could steal the money and not be caught. And although that doesn't justify doing it, uh, it, it, it is, it is going to increase the likelihood, of course, of fraud happening. And it will also increase the likelihood of uh, rationalization happening. The rationalization often taking the place uh, in something like this. They would say, well, if the company is, is, is that, um, the rationalization would often sound something like this. They would say, well, if the company is, is that unconcerned that they're going to put the money in the middle of the lunchroom, then they deserve, you know, basically for it to be stolen. And so it's okay for me to steal it or something like that. And, and of course, that's wrong. That, the, that That's not correct way of thinking. But you can see how that rationalization would happen. Another common rationalization is like saying that the company is, has a lot of money and they do well and I'm poor, I'm, I, you know, I don't have as much money, I have, I have need for money and the company is just a, you know, a cold entity whereas I'm a person that uh, could use the money <laughs> and therefore it's like taking from the, from the rich and giving to the poor, the company being the rich and me being the poor is another kind of rationalization that could take place. Again, not correct uh, kind of rationalization it doesn't justify you know taking the money from the corporation but you can see how that those are kind of rationalization processes that could happen internal controls then would of course one try to safeguard safeguard the assets would be one of the first uh, internal controls that we would put in place and we'd want to put in some other internal controls often the separation of duties so that it would take more than one person in order to commit theft would be some of the other types of internal controls. The main internal control that we look at in terms of financial accounting is, of course, the double entry accounting system itself. Things like bank reconciliations are another key component in terms of the internal controls. We are now able to define profession, define ethics as it relates to accounting, explain the factors that increase the likelihood of fraud, describe internal controls.